uh, omega pill first, and then we'll try to make this breakout happen. Let's see. Can you hear me? Hi, so I'm Dr. Reagan Foley. I work with Dr. Carsten Bonneman at the NIH, and many of you know um, probably that we used to work at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, but now with the NIH, and we um, first mentioned the opportunity to have a trial for collagen 6 and Marist inefficiency back in 2008 when we heard about this compound being available, but um, due to logistics, the trial only started back in 2015, but I'm happy to tell you that it's it's been successful, it's almost finished, and I wanted to tell you about the opportunities it's provided and the challenges and what we've learned, and um, most importantly, the fact that we have a trial for collagen 6 and Marist inefficiency is in itself a huge stepping stone and a huge success. So just very quickly, background, the compound, uh, this is the chemical name and the chemical structure, but the take home message is it was first measurable in, in 2004 in the blood, and then they had done some safety studies in human, in humans and healthy adults first. So they knew that they um, could measure it. So they did PK studies, pharmacokinetic studies first in healthy adults. And then following that, this same study drug had been used in two different adult neurological disorders because it had been felt that this study drug might be effective for those conditions. So this first trial was in Parkinson's disease. And, and that was a large international trial. And it was multiple doses of this same study drug but did not prove to be effective in changing the course of Parkinson's disease, but it was, again, tolerated and, uh, by all the uh, participants in that study. And then, secondly, there was a trial for adult patients, again, with um, ALS, which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And in that trial, the patients tolerated the drug, but there was not a beneficial effect um, found. But I mention this because it gives us the understanding that the study drug was was safe in healthy volunteers as well as in two different patient populations of adults with different neurological conditions. Now, this study drug then came into the auspices of Santhera Pharmaceuticals, and because the mechanism of action of this study drug is anti-apoptotic, which means anti-cell death, it was tested first in the Marison-deficient mouse model. So this is... Um, what we call an inhibitor, whoops, sorry, I don't think I have a pointer, but an inhibitor of what we have here, GAP-DH or GAP-DH. So basically the take home message is it was tested in a Marison deficient mouse model and found that it did inhibit or decrease early cell death in the, in the muscle in that mouse model. And it also improved the motor activity ability of the mice and improved survival. This is one mouse model of Marison deficiency and uh, just kind of briefly it showed improvement of the muscle appearance. And this bottom graph just shows a summary that the mice treated with the megapill had longer lifespan. It was then treated in a second mouse model. Again, a mouse model for Maris inefficiency, but a different kind of um, genetic makeup of a mouse model. But in that mouse model, again, a megapill was tested and found that mice treated with the megapill had decreased fibrosis in the muscle and very importantly, decreased fibrosis of the diaphragm. And, um, this is a summary of that kind of data showing, again, again, the left side control and the middle two rows are treated mice with a megapill. So a decreased fibrosis is a kind of the take home uh, message from that um, study. Then a megapill was studied in the collagen six mouse model um, by a colleague of ours in, in Italy, Paolo Bonaldo. It's a particular mouse model for collagen six deficiency. And in that mouse model, a megapill was found to decrease apoptosis or early cell death in the diaphragm of that mouse model. And that's very important to us because we know in collagen 6, the diaphragm is very much involved more than um, in other conditions per se. So it's kind of a very significant involvement in the diaphragm which contributes to um, decreased um, pulmonary function. And so that was an important finding. And also the skeletal muscle in those mice had improved mitochondrial function. So Based on those mouse studies, both in the Marison deficient mouse models and the collagen 6 deficient mouse model, um, plans move forward to bring this study drug to both collagen 6 and Marison deficient patients. And the name of that trial is very long. It's congenital muscular dystrophy ascending multiple dose cohort study. I'm sorry, I know she's signing. <laughs> Analyzing pharmacokinetics at three dose levels in children and adolescents with assessment of safety and tolerability of a megapill. And 
short name is Callisto. And we outlined this study design back in 2008. Um, and again, we aimed it for both the college and six Emerison deficient patients. Initially intended to have two sites for the trial, one at the NIH and one in London. But due to logistics, um, it was not feasible to have the two sites. And so we have just the one site here at the NIH. Um, we are fortunate to have in the audience today a family member who participated, uh, whose daughter was in the trial. So Pat May's daughter was part of the trial, so I think he wanted to ask about um, his experience. But um, the um, one thing to mention is that the compound, Megapel, is um, the rights to the compound is under the auspices of Santhera Pharmaceuticals, and some of them are here actually at the conference. And the drug has orphan drug designation and fast track designation, which are just some designations which help um, not only support the trial with funding, but also help it on its progress towards uh, moving forward to potentially net further stages of studies. Whoops. Um, so very importantly to highlight is this is the first drug trial for college in six and Americin deficiency congenital muscular dystrophy. So that in itself is, is a huge step. Um, it's the first trial of this study drug in children. It had been tried before in adults. And it's a, it's a pharmacokinetic study, studying the level of the drug in the blood in a not small group for considering the rarity of these conditions, a group of 20 individuals. And the design is quite complicated, but in kind of a, a summary, we take um, half the patients that are um, we, I, we ideally wanted to recruit half the patients being collagen 6 and half the patients being Marison deficient, and we were able to achieve that. And then we divided into different dosing uh, groups, and, um, and then throughout the trial, we're reassessing the blood levels of the study drug to determine the study drug dosing for the next group of patients. So that's called the continual reassessment method, a very safe method to measure the levels of the drug before we dose this, this uh, uh, subsequent group of patients. Um, just briefly, this is our study team at the uh, NIH who participated in, uh, or who are still participating in helping this trial run from day to day, um, many of whom are here at this conference um, who are devoted both in, in, the, in the laboratory um, as well as on the clinical side in making this trial run. So it's definitely a group effort, and um, we feel honored to be able to have this trial at the NIH. Um, and we also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Hank Meyer, who's sitting here, who works at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who's been a part of this effort, um, and Dr. Ken Chung from Columbia, who helped design the continual reassessment method. Um, and just briefly, the, the design of the trial is three different cohorts, and the first cohort had four patients. The second cohort had four patients, and the third cohort has 12 patients, and in the third cohort, we have three separate dosing groups of four patients. So it's a bit complicated, but the first cohort was our entry, kind of lower dose, and then we had adjustments of the dose for the second cohort, and adjustments again within the third cohort for the different, different dosing groups based on the data we were receiving from our patients' blood levels of the study drug. And we are presently in the final dosing group, the final four patients of cohort three right now. So we're aiming to finish the study by the end of this year or probably January, February 2018. Um, the, the study was quite, um, has been quite in, in kind of um, frequent visits, so most studies aren't this quite per se intensive, but monthly visits over the course of um, really um, seven months duration. And um, for three of the visits, it's basically a very busy day of drawing multiple blood samples through an intravenous um, IV line to measure the blood level after taking the study drug. To give you a quick idea of what the um, patients have done, and I want to first and foremost thank the patients and their families for their their, their patients, literally, and being part of this trial and the time it took and, um, and being so generous um, and, and really volunteering to be part of the study, it's been immensely helpful. The PK day schedule gives you an idea. It's a long day starting with IV placement in the morning, and then we have timed EKGs and blood draws that um, basically are measuring in the blood the drug level throughout the day to see how it's metabolized. So the key thing is to figure out what's the right dose to to hit the right level of study drug in the blood. And this is, this is what this data has given us. And we have a team of analysts who um, study this PK sample, so pharmacokinetic samples in Switzerland, and then analyze it in great detail. And then we discuss it as, as, a, as a team with other collaborators. So it's been a definitely a huge um, collaboration. So I, I want to just highlight the opportunities this trial has given us. Number one, it's proven that we can recruit and run a clinical trial, both for college and six Emeritus inefficient 
patients. And that's a huge message to send to regulatory agencies as well because it's often difficult to recruit. And that's what a lot of rare diseases have a problem doing is recruiting. And I, I think that we were pleased we could recruit for this and we hope that there would not be a, a stumbling block going forward as well. I think some families felt that they wanted to wait until the phase one study was done to see the data before the next study, but we were, we were lucky to have um, no problems recruiting, although I, I should mention one thing, which is we uh, do have, um, because of um, different uh, reasons, we do have actually one final opening for a uh, Marison deficient patient. So if you are interested, that's kind of a recent like, little update, do let me or Dr. Bonneman know if you are interested in your Marison deficiency um, between the ages of 5 and 16. Um, that's kind of just a recent, um, because of patient dropout. Um, to assess safety and tolerability of megapill um, in children, we were able to do this during the course of the trial, and, and we're continuing to analyze all the safety data. And to understand, very importantly, the metabolism, our pharmacokinetics of, this, of the study drug, um, and its potential for or lack of accumulation, meaning does the study drug accumulate in the blood over time? And we haven't seen that so far, but that's ongoing evaluations. And then we've been able to assess various outcome measures, including exploratory outcome measures. And as probably you've heard, it's very important to define clear outcome measures for future clinical trials. So we need to know what we can measure that might change over the course of a trial that might show improvement beyond just motor function scales and per se, where we're doing very carefully pulmonary function. But we're doing some exploratory outcome measures such as grayscale ultrasound, muscle ultrasound, a very special um, MRI sequence which we can analyze quantitatively. So of the muscles, so we're doing that before study drug exposure and at the end of the trial. And we're doing a special dynamic breathing MRI. So all this is data which we're analyzing as potential future outcome measures for future trials. Um, and we have also collected biomarkers, so blood and urine at the beginning of the trial and after exposure to a study drug at the end of the trial to measure if there's anything in the blood that could be different or the urine, which could be, quote, unquote, a biomarker. So a non-invasive way of, of analyzing potentially the body's response to the study drug. And this data is going to be mined for looking for potential markers that could be helpful for future studies, which, again, would be very important to pushing progress forward and for regulatory agencies. And then finally, the challenge is one thing we didn't recognize before we started the trial is that many of the patients that came um, for the baseline visit didn't have local, quote unquote, um, ideal standard of care. So, and most importantly, most, um, I shouldn't say, shouldn't say most, many patients came to us who should have been on non invasive ventilation based on their pulmonary function. So, namely, bi level positive airway pressure, and they were not at the time of their screening visit. And they recognized that, and we spoke with local teams to make sure the BiPAP got started very quickly. But that was something that we didn't anticipate to have to start many of our patients on BiPAP who should have been started before. So probably take home message is um, BiPAP is, is very important both for Marison deficient and college and six deficient patients. And we should be very carefully monitoring pulmonary function to know that window when we should initiate BiPAP. And that's um, you know, obviously very important for clinical care um, and anticipating any um, needs. So I think early initiation of BiPAP is, is, is a hugely important point. Um, interpretation of pulmonary function testing was a little bit complicated because, as you can imagine, when children were tired at the end of the day in the trial, we didn't get the best effort for the pulmonary function, but repeating the testing the next morning showed us a better effort and a better, um, probably more accurate display of pulmonary function. So we're trying to, to take into account different factors. We don't typically measure pulmonary function every month, and we have been doing that in the trial, so there's some variability in doing that. But again, it was a very careful safety trial, so we were measuring lots of uh, measurements at the trial. Um, the scheduling is a bit tough, um, I think, both for the, you know, the PK day, but also for families kind of trying to balance, very importantly, usually MDA clinic or other things, but we've been able to make that work with the help of um, our scheduler, who's Christopher, who's here, who's been really phenomenal in scheduling the patients. And then finally, one thing which we're working with the sponsor to kind of clarify is there's extensive list of medications that patients were told not to take during the trial, um, including chocolate and, and caffeine, and because the sponsor wasn't sure there might be interaction with the metabolism, because it's a trial focused on studying drug levels in the blood, they had extensive lists, and that probably could be clarified on, by um, further studies of, this, of, the, of the study drug. And then just wanted to follow up by saying we have a rare opportunity for rare diseases, both Marison deficiency and collagen 6 deficiency, and that is we have these, these biomarkers which we collected at baseline and after 12 weeks on study drug. And we could use that data to help understand better the body's response to a megapill and its actual you know, response that could be specific to collagen 6 or Marison deficiency. And then finally, next steps. We, we will have completion of the trial by early 2018, and then data analyses will begin. 
there's a prospect for a phase two trial. We don't know timing or the certainty of that. It depends on all the data we get, the safety and otherwise data and analyses. But we would hope that if the phase two trial um, were to begin, that we would have a wider age range, uh, hopefully multiple sites. Right now, we're just the one site and, and the longer duration of study drug exposure. This was a brief study drug exposure of 12 weeks. We would need a longer duration to really measure an effect. And then um, I, possibly in the future, omega pill might be uh, potential add-on therapy for other, if you use for, in combination with other therapeutic approaches. So I think this has been really a wonderful learning experience and giving us lots of data that we um, will see how the next steps will pan out. But most importantly, I want to acknowledge the College and Six community and the Marist and Efficient community and everyone's devotion um, to bringing this trial forward. This picture was from 2008 when we first discussed the Megapill trial, and many of the people in this picture are now much older. Um, and I, I applaud you for your patience with us in waiting this trial to, to start, and, and I hope that um, we'll be bringing to you more news of further therapeutics coming to you in an, another clinical trial. So that's all I had to say. Yeah, and um, I, I think it... Um, the next, just to, for explanation, so a phase one trial is really um, a trial where one figures out what the drug is doing in the system and what the right dose is and what the drug levels are. Um, and so participating in a phase one trial means you're really devoting your time and effort to something that you're not taking on a long-term basis with an uh, expectation of benefit. So that means the devotion of uh, our families to participate in this trial is extraordinary. A phase two trial then will be uh, designed to look for efficacy, to for, for an effect of the drug for the disease and making it better. And the other thing I think that um, is worthwhile to point out is um, that we actually can do clinical trials in our patient community, so we have now shown this is possible and that we can move forward. So there's no excuse anymore to say, you know, uh, this is, we, we don't know how to do clinical trials, we don't know our outcome measures, we don't know how to do this, we do. So we can move forward. And the other, and, uh, the other th uh, point I think is um, what it takes to even pull off a trial like this, which seems to be limited and, uh, and small, but it takes a lot to pull that off, uh, including uh, from Santera, who devoted um, you know, uh, their effort and commitment to it. Uh, Diana Petraki from Santera has been, uh, she's based in Canada, has been in particularly um, helpful with this, always on board with this. So, um, and then, so we have a, a great, I think, combination from multiple players that are necessary to make something like this happen, like industry of Santera, uh, but also um, advocacy, funding agencies, AFM, Jean-Francois Briand, is, is he here? Um, yeah, so the AFM made the uh, juvenile tox studies possible for this drug, so an uh, effort really to, uh, without that, the trial wouldn't move forward. QCMD um, uh, put, put uh, significant uh, funds and effort into this, in particular Pat May figured out all the financial intricacies and really stuck to it and, and really never gave up to make that happen. Um, a public funding, uh, so a public agency, so the NIH devoted the clinical center and our team uh, to it. Um, the FDA now uh, approved an orphan disease grant uh, for this drug to uh, move this forward. You can see how many different players are necessary to move something that leave, seems like um, you know, a PK study, what's that about? But it, it is about you know, uh, lots of commitment, lots of um, uh, different players and, uh, and uh, stakeholders pitching into this to make it happen. But if that happens, if it comes together, it can happen. Uh, so that, I think, is the, the lesson out of this. Uh, also that I think I want to highlight. Sure. So one of the things that obviously uh, stands uh, uh, you know, pretty obvious with um, any intervention study is that you want to see the signal just from the study drug. Um, and so you want to keep everything else stable. And so one of the things that Reagan pointed out is that if you start a new intervention, whether it's getting spine surgery for scoliosis or start on ventilation or have an escalation of ventilation, that can alter uh, your child's outcome, obviously, better. And you want to know that, that if that does happen, whether it's from a new intervention or whether it's from the study drug itself. And one of the things that we need to do a better job of is providing proper guidance uh, and consistency so that when more studies come available uh, for your children, um, uh, the researchers can be certain that the care that they have at study entry will be consistent uh, through you know, the duration of the study. 
If it's not, then that often requires that a patient be uh, removed from the study or not be included in the final study uh, analysis. And so it's work to still be done. I forgot to acknowledge also Endostem. Endostem also put um, um, money into that. Did I forget any other sponsor? Did I forget anyone else? No, I think I, I covered them all. For them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, it, it, uh, any comments? Santera, um, Jody, do you guys want to comment? AFM, QCMD? <laughs> So I guess we'd just like to thank the community for making this possible on behalf of Santhera and the deep commitment from the families that are participating in the trial that has gone, not gone unnoticed. This is the first go around and hopefully there will be many more. Um, thank you to the NIH for their tireless effort to AFM, to Cure CMD for providing funding for this. Uh, w it was a group effort and without it, it wouldn't be possible. You know, I'd love to open it up if there are any questions from families to you guys. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you said you're gonna open up the age range for the second phase of the trial. What is anticipated there? That's a great question. Um, so uh, we would hope, um, I, I, you know, for our adult patients, they would have the opportunity, I mean, they've heard about this drug for a very long time, to also enroll in a trial. What we don't know is the next um, steps, how things are going to pan out in terms of the final data analysis, the input from the FDA about going forward and what the next uh, age range should be. So it would be a combination of lots of discussions. So, so um, we have PK data on the adult um, uh, people, of course, from the previous studies. So now we have a complete set of PK data throughout the ages. Um, so I think the plan will be to come together with an, a scientific and pharmacological advisory board, um, sit down with Santera um, at the table and other stakeholders and tr figure out what a clever trial design would be that is a, a trial design that is uh, leading us into both a phase two, but also into a pivotal trial, so that we really know at the end of that trial, is this working or not. So it, it should be designed in a trial that gives us the answer um, so that we don't keep doing trials. Um, so that would be the uh, effort. Yeah, it's a question from the masses. <laughs> Who can answer this question? It's a good question, really good question. <laughs> Maybe I'll take a stab at it. You know, there's a lot that needs to be done to move from a phase one to a phase two trial and a lot of conversations that need to be had. So, I mean, we could even begin to speculate on what the timeline would be for an approval. I mean, I think we'd really hesitate to speculate on what the timeline would be f to start a phase two trial. There's, um, you know, we need to look at the outcome measures, what kind of formulation we might bring into uh, an efficacy trial. We would um, want to have the advisors. It, we'd have to have regulatory conversations with the FDA on, on trial design. So, there, I mean, there's so much that needs to happen. Can I do a question? Absolutely. So I will say that one of the best things you can do is contribute your data to the CMDIR and to have as much natural history data about the disease so that when we go to regulators that we can really have a clear picture of what uh, the disease looks like. And so you can say whether your drug is deviating from that or uh, affecting that. But And also like um, uh, Dr. Foley and Dr. Maya were pointing out, um, to, uh, to be in the best possible of health so that the, um, you know, the standard of care that we've all worked out together is adhered to um, so that we have a, um, 
if you will, a trial population that we can actually roll right into a clinical trial. And uh, of course, um, the entry criteria will be reasonably broad. They have to be reasonably broad because this is a rare disease and we have to get a cohort together uh, without you know, hanging out for five years or so. So it has to be relatively tight and, and enrolling quickly, fast, and be efficient about it. Uh, so it, uh, it's better to spend some time ahead of that and just plan it out properly and then really stick to the plan rather than kind of starting and then rumbling along forever. So I think that's the plan. Pat, do you want to uh, say something for QCMD and as a participant in the trial? Yeah. No, absolutely. And I, I think from the QCMD side, and, and I know Jody already said it, but and from the family side, I mean, we went through the process and, and um, it, it felt like, you guys might not have felt like it, but everything seemed to really run very smoothly through the trial. Um, it was very much a team effort. I don't even know. I mean, you saw the number of people there and that were involved, and ultimately they all kind of stopped in and, and helped a, a certain part of the process of the day. And, uh, you know, Aubrey certainly felt very special throughout it as, with all the attention. Um, but it, it is a massive undertaking that you guys took on, and, and uh, it, it went very well. And, and, you know, we couldn't thank you. Uh, it, with me standing up here for two hours talking about it, and, and um, but yeah, it it, uh, it went very well. It, it ultimately, I think the biggest trick was, and you had it on there, was the no caffeine, no chocolate. Yeah. And I think we we were th we were there over Halloween, which was not the coolest time to do it, but um, but uh, it it went pretty well, and and it was pretty short stint from that perspective, and um, you know there wasn't any unusual side effects that we experienced at all. It just kind of worked its way through and, um, you know, it was, it, it was pretty good. So, and if anybody, you know, wants to ask me on a separate deal outside of this, feel free to stop me and talk to me, especially if somebody's interested in being kind of the final person and, you know, I can tell you everything that we saw, so. I think uh, uh, maybe my final word is um, this is um, still, uh, oh, there is a, a question, where? Okay, great, yeah. Um, my final word is, uh, and then I hand it over to you, is um, this is um, still, you have to understand this is a clinical trial still. So we are having a candidate drug that we need to put through the trial phases that are necessary to decide whether a drug is for our community. So it's. Um, I, I, the reason why I'm saying that, I don't want you to sit there and, um, and, and uh, think, oh, that why, why, why is it not, not yet available? Why can't everyone take it? We really have to do this as a clinical trial to get it, move it forward, and get it, if it works, get it to approval so that everyone can get it. I know this is a tedious and, and you know, nerve-wracking process, but it is a necessary process because we really need to know um, that it is actually working, and that's why you do clinical trials. <laughs> yes? Thank you very much for the information. No, just to know if uh, someone here uh, can speak about the effects, uh, how they feel with the trial, what they are expecting, uh, how they are feeling every day, what improvements they have, or what is the outcome of, of, of from a personal point of view. Thanks. Again, I have to emphasize what clinical trial phases are. So this was a phase one trial. Patients were on the drug for a very very limited amount of time. Um, so th we wouldn't expect this drug to reach an efficacy endpoint in the short period that we gave it to the patient for the pharmacokinetic to find the dose. Uh, so that's up to the next phase of the trial when it's given for a longer period of time so it can really have its effect on the system. Um, so really this is why you do these two phases. The first phase is really safety, right dose, uh, pharmacokinetics, and then the efficacy is really the next step. So um, I would caution anyone, um, even who participate in the trial, don't speculate. Um, this is about the next phase. Can I highlight how important uh, patient advocacy groups, case in point, Cure CMB, is not has been not only to launching this trial, making it possible with support, but also for helping us with the recruitment phase. And so when we ne needed basically at the very beginning a few extra patients for that first dosing um, for cohort one, we reached out to the CMDIR, and guess what? We were able to recruit like that because of the registration of patients in the CMDIR. And also when it comes time for this 
study drug or other trials to go forward to regulatory agencies. I think you can see from the press from the past year what happened with Duchenne is that patient advocacy groups can be a massive difference in bringing things forward and I think regulatory agencies are recognizing for rare diseases that they want to hear the voice of the patients and the families. So the role that you play is indispensable. There was another good point here. Um, so um, the, the, the CMDIR plays a huge role in that. Uh, the CMDIR is particularly useful if everyone has genetic testing in there. Um, so uh, everyone who registered, um, if they had had genetic testing, they should submit it to CMDIR so that we know um, that you're really qualifying for this so we can reach out for you. Uh, anyone who hasn't had genetic testing, okay, uh, should, um, some respirator going off, I think. So um, uh, everyone who hasn't had um, genetic testing should work with uh, their local team or with the CMDIR to try to get that um, done. I think it's important, it's a good point. Yeah. 